tonight on CBC Vancouver News. That's pretty hard ask for a lot of people because most people are selfish and they don't care. Tough sell. Will the no safe six in your home plea resonate in the region hardest hit by COVID? Also. Sadly, we have one additional death to report today in the Fraser Health region. A woman in her 80s who went to a small family birthday party, the latest victim of COVID-19. And... He just thought he was smarter than everybody, and I, he probably was in some respects. Who killed Davis Wolfgang Hawk? A dramatic twist in a three-year-old Squamish murder case. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. A powerful message from BC's top doctor today, delivered in the area hardest hit by COVID-19. For the first time since the pandemic began, Dr. Bonnie Henry was in Surrey to give her daily update. A seemingly small move, but a symbolic one, as the province moves to curb a big rise in the Fraser Health Authority's case numbers. Numbers which, unfortunately today, include another death, bringing the total to 262. 234 new cases were announced today, many of them once again in Fraser Health. There are now 2,344 active cases, and the number of people under active public health monitoring has skyrocketed by about 700 since Monday, now sitting at more than 5,700. There are 86 people in hospital, 24 of them in intensive or critical care. Now, the Fraser Health Region continues to lead the province in new COVID-19 cases. And in hopes of getting people to pay attention, Dr. Henry was also accompanied by the authority's president, Dr. Victoria Lee. Our Joel Ballard was listening in on today's update. He joins us now live from the central city in Surrey, just outside Fraser Health's offices tonight. So, Joel, what's the latest from that region? Mike, the numbers illustrate just how urgent the situation is here in the Fraser Health region. Of the 234 cases announced today, 74% of them are from this area. This is the region which has been hardest hit by COVID-19 right now. Now, we've been hearing from Dr. Henry for the past week about our safe six. That's the number outside of our household that we can invite into our homes. But Fraser Health took it a step farther on Tuesday saying we should uh, consider not even inviting our safe six inside of our homes. Now that messaging created a bit of confusion. People weren't sure if it was an order or a recommendation. Today, Dr. Lee clarified. You've said that you should not have your even your safe six in your private home to have parties and events and celebrations. Now, we're also asking everybody that uh, because even small gatherings can be risky, even with your safe six, to really take a pause, reconsider whether it's necessary to have people over in your home. So, Joel, is uh, the new messaging making its way to the public? Are they aware of these new recommendations? Well, I've been in Surrey all day. I've had a chance to chat with a number of people and overwhelmingly, most of them hadn't heard about the new recommendations. There were some people who knew the, the safe six term, but they weren't aware that they were being advised to consider not inviting that safe six inside of their homes. Now, once I did have a chance to explain it to them, most of the people seemed to agree. No, I haven't heard anything, no. Big groups, that doesn't help anybody, that just have some more room for cross-contamination and spreading the disease even further. It makes sense because we have a small family, me, my husband and my old daughter, right? And like, we don't really let anyone come in our house because like, we don't know where they've been. In. COVID's not stopping at all. Uh, people aren't taking it seriously enough. So for sure that this new rule is definitely gonna help out a lot. For me, it's kind of like all background noise. It's the same thing from the start. Mike, health authorities have been reiterating for the past couple of weeks that the most of the cases that we're seeing are coming from gatherings, parties, even small ones. And we're also hearing that Fraser Health region in specific is a COVID-19 hotspot because it has the highest density of multi-generational families living in close proximity. Mike. All right, Joel, thanks very much. Joel Ballard reporting live tonight from Surrey. And Dr. Henry says the death of that one person from COVID-19 today is a sad warning about how quickly this disease can spread and kill. 
Our Dan Burra joins us now live with more on that. So, Dan, uh, first of all, who is this woman? She was in her 80s, Mike. She lived in the Fraser Health region, and Dr. Bonnie Henry says she contracted COVID at a small birthday party. Less than 10 people were there, but someone unknowingly brought that disease in. Most of the people at the party got COVID-19, and the elderly woman died in hospital. And I know her family and the care teams and the community mourn her as we do as well. It reminds us that this virus can't tell the difference and even a small gathering when this virus is circulating can be dangerous. We also heard from Adrian Dix for the first time at COVID briefings today since the provincial election. The health minister says part of the challenge during this pandemic is for people to learn to grieve together somehow. Beyond the sadness, though, he says next week he'll share more information on their push to hire more long-term care workers. To create uh, the supports necessary to expand uh, visitation, it's an extraordinary effort. We, and we've had an extraordinary response in these times for people who want to be part of it, who want to be health care workers, and I see that as a very positive step. Dr. Henry says they are working with BC's seniors advocate and will be making some changes to support families and those living in care. Mike? All right, Dan Burrett reporting live tonight. Thanks. And a Surrey caregiver is asking the province for emergency funding for home share providers. She says for many of them during this pandemic, their jobs have turned into 24-hour care seven days a week. And as Zara Premji explains, they say not only are they burning out, it's also draining their pockets. Do you know where the salt is? No, it's good. It's right there. Lisa Garner says she finds joy in teaching 62-year-old Paul how to bake, cook, and clean, all part of her daily routine as his home share provider for the last 18 years. His legal guardians have asked we don't use his name. We're good. We just need a little more oil. Garner is among thousands of home share providers across the province who are employed to provide care for adults living with developmental disabilities, living together, providing meals, care and support. And she says that work has become 24 seven since the start of the pandemic, explaining that's because support programs have either been canceled or scaled back for COVID safety. And Paul is too vulnerable to send out right now. My client would go from 8.30 in the morning till three in the afternoon. I'm now having to create a day program in those hours. I can't do anything else, can't go anywhere. The president of the BC Home Share Providers Association, Selena Martin, says many of the 600 providers she represents are in the same boat. Probably over 80% of the caregivers haven't had a break since March. And so imagine working 24 seven and no time off. Do you want to build something? She says arts and crafts like Garner is doing here with Paul would usually happen at the daytime programs and caregivers would be working a different job. But now for many home share providers, they live with no break and they say they're not receiving extra pay for it. And the association is calling on the province for more emergency funds and aids to compensate for this. We need to have respite homes and emergency beds available. We can't find workers, or if we do find workers, often we are paying the worker more than we are paid per day. The province says it provided more than $15 million in extra support funding from April until August. Garner received $1,200 a month for that time, putting the dollars towards Paul's needs. But while the funding has since stopped, Garner says her devotion to Paul has not. When my son was younger, he used to call him Uncle Paul because he didn't understand because I had Paul longer than I had my son. We do this because we genuinely care for the individuals and, and, you know, want them to have somewhere to live. Martin says her association was formed in 2012 because the contracted caregivers have no union and feel their calls for additional help are being ignored. The province tells CBC News it is working to identify ongoing support needs of families and providers. Martin and Garner say they need to see those funds and aids now. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. The owner of a North Vancouver bakery that has been a fixture in central Lonsdale for 23 years is being evicted. Jay Darvishi says he's losing his business because his landlord refused to apply for the federal rent subsidy. Golosan Bakery on Lonsdale Avenue is a successful and growing business until COVID-19 hit. Revenue dropped by 70%. And Darvishi said he was unable to pay full rent starting in April. He should have been eligible for the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program, except it required landlords to apply on behalf of their tenants. 
and he says his landlord chose not to. I, I don't know what can I explain, you know, I feel so sad. Um, somebody losing business, I am here in the center of Lansdale, um, in this location, um, years and years and years. Last night I couldn't sleep a wink. I wake up at 4 a.m. Uh, I feel like, like, you know, landlord has a power and business owner is a slave. He says his eviction means 14 employees will now lose their jobs. Two satellite stores will also be put out of business. One man is dead. A woman is injured after a stabbing last night at a home in Maple Ridge. RCMP were called to a house in a cul-de-sac around 11 last night. Inside, they found the body of a man in his 20s. An adult woman was hospitalized with non-life-threatening stab wounds. The integrated homicide investigation team says a man in his early 20s has been arrested in relation to the stabbings. Police say all people involved were members of the same immediate family and lived in that house together. Uh, we believe this was a isolated incident. Uh, we don't believe there's any risk to the public safety. Now, having said that, uh, as you can imagine, as we can certainly imagine, this was indeed a tragic case. And uh, needless to say, we will be providing support to those affected. Police are asking anyone with information to call IHIT, Ridge Meadows RCMP, or Crime Stoppers. To Squamish now, where a years-long cold case took a dramatic turn today. Police have identified a body that was found inside a burnt vehicle back in 2017. As John Hernandez reports, the victim was a prolific neo-Nazi from the United States who spent years on the run. It is truly a mystery. It is truly a, a case of who done it. A major finding that spurred more questions than answers. We have a name, we have an age, we have a photograph. The man pictured here was known for years by the alias Jesse James. He was an avid rock climber in Squamish who lived out of his car. In 2017, his body was found inside a burnt out SUV along a forest service road. He was shot dead. Police were unable to figure out his real name until now. American born Davis Wolfgang Hawk. We were able to confirm his identity through DNA. He was reported missing from his family, by his family. Uh, in the United States. Gone but far from forgotten, Hawk was a known neo-Nazi with a highly publicized past. He's a puzzle. He really is. Once a child chess prodigy, he grew up under a swath of different names. He organized hate marches, including one that drew hordes of police and counter-protesters in Washington, D.C. I think he had like a superiority complex, you know, in the sense of um, he just thought he was smarter than everybody, and I, he probably was in some respects. Investigative reporter Brian McWilliams followed him for years during the early 2000s. That's when Hawk started an online spam ring. He peddled penis enhancement pills and suckered users for millions of dollars. And ultimately, he was just a con man, and he figured out how to use the internet to, you know, get what he not what, what he wanted, which was just quick money, easy money. A campaign that put him on the wrong end of a $12 million lawsuit by AOL. He fled the country, his whereabouts unknown until today. That kind of end for a guy like him doesn't surprise me. He was a guy who always sort of lived on the edge. Family members told CBC News they've been made aware of his death, calling it sad and admitting Hawk had an insecure side. As for his murder, it's still shrouded in mystery, a page-turning saga with chapters yet to be written. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Five suspected drug labs have been put out of commission in Richmond after raids by two separate police forces. Richmond Mounties hit two private homes on the west side of the city suspected of producing illicit drugs. At least two dozen officers, many in hazmat suits, descended on that house. They uncovered what investigators called a synthetic drug lab containing volatile chemicals that threatened the neighborhood. Another nearby home was also raided, and CBC News has learned the Richmond RCMP probe was separate from three other simultaneous raids in their city conducted by Delta police. That force hit three commercial properties in East Richmond, suspected to be illegal cannabis operations. Several people have been arrested. Charges have yet to be laid.
Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou has scored a legal victory in her bid to fight extradition to the United States. In a ruling released today, the judge overseeing the case says the defense can pursue claims the foundation of the fraud case against Meng is flawed. The decision relates to a hearing last month where Meng Wanzhou's lawyers argued the U.S. deliberately misled Canada by omitting facts. Meng is charged with fraud, accusing of lying to HSBC in a PowerPoint about Huawei's relationship with a subsidiary that was violating U.S. sanctions against Iran. But Meng's lawyers claim the U.S. left parts of that PowerPoint out of the facts they provided Canada for the extradition hearing. A BC First Nation near Bella Coola has voluntarily evacuated its community as a flood watch continues for the central coast. The nation in the river's inlet area fears flooding and landslides could be triggered by heavy rain that's been falling there since Tuesday. The head of the regional district who sent us this video says the community's first diking system was breached, but a second one is holding. The River Forecast Center predicting more rainfall through today and tomorrow. It's advising the public to stay clear of the fast-flowing rivers and potentially unstable riverbanks. Johanna Wagstaff, uh, armed with uh, all kinds of defenses against the rain tonight, joins us with our first check of the forecast. They got a lot of rain in, in that part of our province for certain. Yeah, it's true. And we've got one more push, as you mentioned, for central coastal sections. The drizzle that we've been seeing for three days now in Vancouver is underneath that main stream of moisture that's been hitting those areas, seeing the flooding. That whole system is morphing and we will get a bit of a push. We'll get a taste of that rain overnight tonight. Let me show you uh, the rainfall warnings. First of all, still in place. In fact, they have been extended northward slightly. Uh, parts of these rainfall warnings will see snow tomorrow. Uh, Terrace and Stewart, 10 to 20 centimeters as that cold front pushes inland. So what was a stream of moisture is now buckling. We've got a center of low sitting just off Haida Gwaii. This whole system finally moving inland after stalling out for a few days. So what that means for us here in Vancouver, uh, the showers ramping up to some steadier rain between midnight and 4 a.m. I think is when we'll see the steadiest of the rain and some gusty winds as well as that front rolls through. I think we're looking at lingering showers through Friday morning, but then look at that, a nice clearing for the afternoon. So I'll take you through the full forecast, at, including the weekend, coming up in a bit. Okay, Joe, thanks very much. I want to remind you, you can also watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Another horrific attack in France, this time on a church. Why a basilica in Nice was targeted next. And thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream tonight. Well, a bird watching group that took flight in England is now spreading its wings here in Canada. A chapter of the group has landed in Toronto with the goal of bringing people of colour together in nature. And as Nazima Walji reports, the club is much more than just about bird watching. You know, it's been a crazy 2020. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Thank Thanks. You. It starts with a huddle. Then on a brisk Sunday afternoon, hoping for a rare sighting, Kazim Kute leads a group of birders in Toronto's Tommy Thompson Park. What flock together is a bird watching gang for black, brown, POC people. <laughs> Kute is the leader of the Toronto chapter of Flock Together, a bird watching collective created to confront the underrepresentation of people of color in the natural world. I know nothing about birds. None of the people in here know nothing about birds, but I think it's just the willingness to try something and also the willingness to be like, hey, you know what, like, let's reclaim this space. The walks also double as a space for healing and act as a mental health support network for members of the flock. So there's that freedom to disclose, like, things that we feel uncomfortable of or, like, what we've been going through. Connecting with people who are also feeling the same way helps a lot. Like it's like a huge weight just lifted off my, my shoulders. I wish we started this sooner. The movement began in London, England, as lockdown restrictions began to ease this past summer. It was founded by Ali Alana Peekham and Nadine Pereira. For over 10 years now, Pereira says he's been finding relief from bird watching. I was going through my teenage years in a very turbulent state, so to speak, 
and gained great perspective, great benefit, great uh, mental tools to, to deal with whatever I was going through. Uh, through the practice of bird watching. The idea behind Flock Together culminated at the height of the George Floyd protests and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. So we just knew our people needed it more than ever. This is the second excursion for the group, and all you need is a pair of binoculars and a camera. Um, you don't need to know about birds. Sightings are a bonus. Seagulls, <laughs> a lot of seagulls. I guess it makes sense because we're by the water, but you know, the idea of being here makes it more exciting. So these aren't just average seagulls, they're, they're bird watching seagulls. <laughs> Toronto's not the only city creating its own flock. Flock Together chapters are also being organized in places like Oslo, New York, and LA. Link up around the world, global gang, so. The objective, yeah, so for BIPOC to find a safe space in any part of the world they might be in. Nazima Walji, CBC News, Toronto. All right, we've got uh, national and international news to come. Lots of COVID news from across the country and around the world. And, of course, the latest on that attack in Nice, France. Stay with us. Be right back. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Don't miss this year's Vancouver Podcast Festival. Join Faith Fundell, host of They and Us, and various CBC podcasters at this year's festival from the comfort of your own home. And join Gloria Makarenko for the 65 Roses Six Feet Away Soiree, a virtual experience in support of Cystic Fibrosis Canada. Get your tickets today at 65rosesgala.com and enjoy an evening of celebration. Ontario's COVID-19 numbers are expected to continue growing in the weeks ahead, but likely not at the same rate as it's seen recently. Lorenda Renikoff has the latest messaging and modeling data from that province. The trajectory appears to be moving away from the worst case, uh, but cases are continuing to climb. Not sharply, but still. The latest modeling shows some concerning increases, especially in some of the hot zones. We are seeing continued growth in cases, as Dr. Brown had said. We are not going on a decline right now, but we are not going as steep of a curve. Whether it's cases per 100,000 people, the percent of people testing positive, particularly in Toronto and Peel, or the cases where they can't track where someone caught the virus. Hospitalizations aren't increasing as quickly as expected, so officials say it's unlikely surgeries will have to be limited to make room for COVID patients. I think it's important to emphasize, though, is that this disease, particularly because it can spread so quickly with these super spreader events, can dramatically turn and you can have rapid, rapid growth uh, quite quickly. So we are slowing the curve and bend it. That means we're, it's our plan. We don't have to uh, push back on our hospitals. We don't have to put curfews and lockdowns. That's our plan. Earlier in the day, the Premier suggested a somewhat rosier picture. Uh, the, the good news is we're, we're seeing a little bit of a decline, but make no mistake it, and make no mistake about it. Please do not let our guard down. We can't. It happened before, and it just spiked up. The health advisors say an example of the complexities if people do let their guard down, two outbreaks are weddings, and one includes people from eight different health regions. And the data shows the average age of people being infected is getting older, now 40 years old. One concerning number, cases rising in long-term care and retirement homes among both residents and staff. The health officials say it's still too early to say whether the modified stage two will end after 28 days in the hardest hit regions. For Toronto, Peel and Ottawa, that ends in just over a week. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Over the past month, CBC News has uncovered two cases where U.S. business executives had Canada's mandatory quarantine period waived by border services agents. The government called those decisions mistakes. 
Well, now a CBC News investigation has discovered a third case, but this time the approval came directly from a cabinet minister. CBC's Jonathan Gatehouse with details. Canada's borders are officially closed, but still busy, as essential workers travel back and forth, exempt from quarantine. But CBC News has learned that in 191 cases, business travelers who aren't essential workers have also been allowed to skip quarantine. After getting a special exemption from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, François-Philippe Champagne, he's issued 138 in the past six weeks alone. One of those exemptions went to Nando Cesarone, the U.S. president of global shipping company UPS. Cesarone flew into Canada for three days last week and met with employees at two locations in the Toronto area, lobbying them on a new contract. Christopher Monette is with the union that represents UPS workers. We all need to be playing by the same set of pandemic rules here. Two UPS employees tell CBC News that at one point, Cesarone removed his mask in a crowded meeting as he spoke for nearly an hour. The company declined to discuss the purpose of Cesarone's trip, but insisted in a statement that he observed a detailed risk mitigation plan, which included masking, social distancing, testing, and other precautionary measures. Today in the House, the opposition charged there's so a double a standard. Question. Why is there still one set of rules for wealthy, well-connected elites and a different set for everyone else? Exemptions have been granted after extensive consultation by Global Affairs Canada's officials. You know, we conduct Parliament through Zoom. I don't see the necessity to have some special exemption like this. I can't go to Ottawa and, 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 and come back to St. John's, Newfoundland without a 14-day exemption. According to Global Affairs, these business mobility exemptions are only handed out in exceptional circumstances where the immediate need to travel is thoroughly justified. It won't say how Cesarone's trip met that standard or who received the other 190 exemptions. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. The number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 in India has dipped sharply from last month's peak, but even at a reduced pace, the country's total is now at more than 8 million cases. The only other country to top the 8 million mark is the United States. India has the world's third highest number of fatalities at over 120,000, Officials fear gatherings for India's upcoming Diwali festival of lights will raise infection numbers. Many are concerned the second wave of the pandemic will be more severe than the first. The embattled Canadian Museum for Human Rights is now facing another controversy. Earlier this summer, it dealt with complaints of racism, abuse and sexual harassment. As Austin Gravish reports, the museum is now dealing with accusations of censorship. These internal emails say abortion and pregnancy were off limits for religious schools coming through the museum. There's got to be accountability uh, for those who allowed that to happen. Internal 2017 emails show Hutterite colonies and religious schools regularly asked to omit content. An employee writing that she got direction from a superior to allow the requests. She told the manager she would put a note in a school's file that would say, quote, We need to be very conscious that the tour guide does not use the words or speak about pregnancy, abortion, or gay rights. It is imperative that these things are not included in the tour due to their cultural beliefs. This current museum staffer says her supervisor told her to avoid women's content like abortion while giving a tour to a religious school group. She says she was sometimes asked not to mention anything that would empower women, including human rights pioneer Viola Desmond. We've now confirmed that they also allowed requests uh, to uh, exclude anything around women's rights, uh, particularly abortion. This new development comes months after the resignation of museum CEO John Young, as well as a manager and an employee. Young left after CBC revealed staff were sometimes forced to hide same-sex material from tours. The revelation came on the heels of allegations of systemic racism, sexual harassment and discrimination. The museum will not say how much Severance Young or the other employees got when they left. But internal documents show almost $310,000 in severance has been paid this year. It's the most the museum has ever paid. When you do find people at senior levels getting severance packages, they do tend to be high because oftentimes for those employees, it's going to take them a while to find new work. 
The museum says content about reproductive rights isn't included in programs for school groups. A spokesperson says the museum isn't aware of any employee being told to avoid talking about women's rights and says if reproductive rights came up, it would be a welcome discussion. Austin Gravish, CBC News, Winnipeg. France is on edge tonight and on alert after what French leaders are calling another terrorist attack. Three people brutally murdered inside a church. It comes as tensions are high over caricatures printed in that country of the Prophet Muhammad. Margaret Evans gives us a look at what happened and the lives taken. France in the grip of another gruesome attack. Three people killed by a knife-wielding assailant at a church in Nice this morning. One victim apparently beheaded. We saw by the windows that there were many, many, many policemen coming. And uh, then we heard gunshots, many gunshots. Distraught parishioners gathered at the scene. One of the victims apparently a church warden. <laughs> I'm so shocked, said this woman. I see him walking, lighting candles. Now I'm thinking he's not there anymore. The attacker was shot and injured by police, who've identified him as a 21-year-old recently arrived Tunisian man. The mayor of Nice called it an act of Islamofascism. There was no doubt what was behind the attacker's actions, he said. He didn't stop saying Allahu Akbar while he was being treated. Local Muslim leaders have strongly condemned the attack. France was already on edge, shaken by the murder two weeks ago of Samuel Paty, a teacher beheaded after showing caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad as part of a class discussion. Ce matin, nous avons décidé... Visiting the scene today, the French president Emmanuel Macron said France is under attack. He's ordered thousands more soldiers to the streets and raised the country's terrorist alert to the highest level. Macron's refusal to denounce the Muhammad cartoons have prompted outrage and protests in many parts of the Muslim world. Church bells across France rang today in honor of the victims of this latest attack. And as night fell, the city and the rest of the country were also entering another stage of strict pandemic lockdown, a reminder that Macron has more than one crisis on his hands. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. A real estate giant is under fire tonight for secretly capturing images of patrons at malls like Pacific Center. What Cadillac Fairview might use your image for next. News Magazine takes a mountain side view of the longest postal route in Canada. It's a 54 mile ride in the heart of the Kootenai Range of the Rocky Mountains. And the postman is a postwoman, Mrs. Connie Cummins. Mrs. Cummins delivers the mail for 400 families, Monday to Saturday, whatever the weather. And this in spite of the treacherous hazards of mountain driving. The route is not only the longest in Canada, but just about the most difficult. But there are compensations. Mrs. Cummins has even more friends than ordinary postmen, and all of them ready for a chat. Sometimes she's their only contact with the town for days at a time. No time on the long route to get out of her Jeep, but a hooked stick does the job ingeniously and fast. The postwoman's route goes by water as well as land. A ferry saves miles and enables her to take in more customers. She 
She often runs errands to oblige her many friends. Mrs. James' daughter forgets her lunch, so Mrs. Cummins takes it along to the school. busy route, but the view in the Rockies is always a record breaker. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. And even though it was a small party in one person's home, the majority of people who were in that home became infected with COVID-19. And this person, um, unfortunately, ended up in hospital and dying from it. A woman in her 80s who attended a small birthday party is the latest victim of COVID-19. Dr. Bonnie Henry used the death to enforce how easily the virus can be transmitted. And she delivered the message in the Fraser Health region today, which has been hard hit by COVID. Henry is reporting 234 new cases in our province and that one new death. I mean, ultimately, he was just a con man and he figured out how to use the Internet to, you know, get what he not what he wanted, which was just quick money, easy money. A man who was found shot to death inside a burned vehicle in Squamish in 2017 has now been identified as U.S. resident Davis Wolfgang Hawk. Hawk was also known in the local Squamish community as Jesse James, an avid local climber. The question now, who killed him and why? Well, if you shop in malls in our country, your data may have been collected by concealed cameras without you having a clue. Thomas Dagla with where it happened and why the privacy concerns are being raised. For a couple of months in 2018, a trip to the mall may have meant being analyzed by facial recognition technology. The only hint while walking in, that blue decal warning about cameras in use. I think it would make sense maybe if they put like a sign up that said, uh, this is what's happening, just so you know. You don't give permission to, for, to these people to do any of this. When shoppers would check the mall directory, an embedded camera would take their picture, their data then analyzed to learn the customer's age and gender. The privacy watchdogs of Canada, Alberta and BC identified 12 Cadillac Fairview malls in five provinces, including Toronto's Eaton Centre and the Chinook Centre in Calgary. If they're going to collect it, particularly sensitive information, they have to get your permission to do it. And that did not happen in this case. This all came to light after a shopper in Calgary got suspicious, seeing the words face analyzer left on screen by accident. Turns out there was yet another company working for Cadillac Fairview, storing the numerical representations of 5 million faces. This suggests to people that their personal information may be captured in ways that they were never aware of and that that information can somehow end up in the hands of third parties. Everyone's biometric data is personal and experts worry it could be stolen. Cadillac Fairview stresses no faces were stored. Even if this data is anonymized, don't you think that shoppers would be surprised to know that this sort of information is being gathered about them when they're looking at a mall directory? It's fairly common now within public spaces, and I think, you know, whether you're in an office building or a uh, shopping mall, I don't think people would be surprised by that. Um, so I, I, I think um, there would have been, you know, some general expectation that that kind of behavior was uh, taking place. Cadillac Fairview says the cameras were deactivated and the technology won't be used again. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. 
after 30 years in politics, one of the B.C. legislature's most familiar faces is calling it a career. Carol James announced she would not run for re-election after being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease earlier this year. She spoke to CBC News to look back on a storied career and to look ahead to what's next. <laughs> I was so extraordinarily proud, first of the Premier uh, and the work that, that John Horgan's done for our team. Uh, but I think of all the people, I think of our entire team, I think of a brand new group coming into government because most of us had not been in government before. A couple of MLAs, Mike Farnworth, who'd been in government. But the rest of us, uh, it was a new experience. And so it, it's really been over the last few days a, a trip down memory lane uh, to have a chance to be able to reflect on, on the experiences that I've had, the differences that we've been able to make. and so. To see that kind of success on Saturday night really was, it's been pretty extraordinary. The biggest piece I remember was putting my name forward to run for leadership. There were seven of us uh, who were running. Putting my name forward and people saying, why on earth would you do that? <laughs> why on earth would you take on that job uh, when there are only two seats in the legislature, when the rebuilding is going to take centuries to be able to get there? Why would you take it on? And, and I guess for me, it's again, a kind of a reflection of what I've done in my life, which is I don't tend to take on the easy things. I tend to take on the challenging pieces. I tend to take on organizations and structures when they need support and when they need people who work hard and who are going to get in there and really solve the problems. Boxing is one of those exercises uh, that has actually been proven in research to assist with Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is a progressive disease, so you can't stop the progression, but you can deal with the symptoms. Uh, and one of those exercises is boxing because it helps with hand-eye coordination, with returning your brain, with balance, all of those issues that become a challenge with Parkinson's. Uh, so much to the surprise of my kids, who I don't, I'm not sure they really believe that I'm going to follow through with it, I'm determined to do something completely out of my comfort zone and, uh, and do some boxing classes and do some boxing lessons to be able to again be a bit proactive about some of the balance issues and some of the tremor issues that I'm having with Parkinson's. Yeah, I couldn't do this without the support of my family and, and that certainly goes for me as well, whether it's my mom who trained me up <laughs> to be an activist uh, in my early years, whether it's my husband who has always been there. Uh, we joke that we spent more time apart since we've been married than together because he works up north and I work here, uh, so I'm looking forward to having a bit more time there. And then my kids and my grandkids who, you know, there have been things I've missed out on. Uh, there have been opportunities I've missed out on and, uh, and they've been incredibly patient and incredibly supportive uh, of the work that I've done uh, and I am so proud uh, of my of my family and the and the help that they've been I couldn't do this job if it wasn't for family and friends and that's why I remind MLAs when they come in politics will come and go but your family and your friends you've got to make sure you hang on to those relationships uh, don't forget that when you've got caught up in the craziness of your schedule and the busyness that's going to be there um, remember those people when politics is gone you want those people there with you you want to be appreciative of the work and the support that they've given you as well. Well, once again, Florida is battleground central as the U.S. election ground nears. How Biden and Trump are hoping to woo voters to their side after the break. 6.43 Thursday evening. A live look at downtown Victoria tonight. Dry, it appears for right now, but a bit of rain Expected to hit the island and the south coast this evening, but what about the forecast for our socially distant trick-or-treaters? Joe's Halloween forecast is coming next. in Carboneer about uh, four years ago now. We were uh, living in Australia and we wanted to move back to Newfoundland and we came across this house that had been on the market for a while. We bought it right away even without seeing it uh, in person. When we came back, there was kind of an immediate unease about the house. It's a, it's a house in the center of downtown Carboneer, but somehow 
as it's a house on top of a hill in the middle of a field, it feels so isolated. And it's that gigantic, very, very creepy, massive tree on the front of the yard that blocked the view of the whole house from the city. There's been a number of instances that are a bit weird <laughs> and definitely made us question our sanity at times. We had been in the shed every day nearly um, for the whole year we were living in the house uh, because you know we were doing, using a storage and for renovation. Now the shed's locked, so I knew that it was only myself and Chris who had access to it. And right in the middle of the floor in the attic was this piece of paper. So we took the piece of paper and it had this poem on it. But at the end of, uh, of this note, was uh, two lines that had been added and it said uh, beneath your invisible tree uh, there lay a gift for you uh, and so which kind of both give chills up our spine there was just no reason for it to be in there we still have no idea how it got there one day myself and larry were outside building a fire and this is at night looking up at the house in the guest bedroom there was a white like object in the shape of a person that moved across the window in the completely dark pitch room. It reminded me of if Larry were in the window wearing his, um, he has a white uh, knitted, almost like captain's like sweater. All upstairs, the lights were off. We had two friends with us who were in the kitchen and I, I could see them in the kitchen and the other side, bottom corner of the house. No cars were going by. There was nothing nearby to add a light. And then the next morning, one of our friends who was coming out in the hallway, she heard someone walking down the stairs and she went to the stairwell and she saw Larry, who often wears a white sweater, and saw him turn around the corner. And then she also then heard him start to kind of be in the kitchen and start breakfast. And she went downstairs to go see him, and but he wasn't there. We don't usually sell our house as a haunted house to Airbnb guests, um, but one pair, um, so that they saw two, a pair of red eyes in the window in the guest bedroom uh, when they woke up in, in the middle of the night. For those who want to learn more about the haunted past or potentially the darker history of Carboneer, um, the best way to find out is to come in and ask the locals yourself. It's their story to tell and, and, and they definitely have no problem telling it. When your backyard is burning, is anywhere safe? I'm Adrian Lamb, the host of a new podcast, World on Fire. Join us on the front lines of wildfires burning around the world. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Market Report is brought to you by Fortis BC. We've got even bigger rebates. Rebate. Whoa. On select high efficiency equipment for business, but only for a limited time. Johanna Wagstaff uh, back with us uh, now on the forecast. We've been kind of doing a, a musical theme based on the sky in behind you. And yes. The other night we had purple and uh, featuring Prince, I guess. What did we mm -hmm. do last? Oh, we did Earth, Wind, and Fire. Earth, Wind, that, Fire. I said, how about uh, ACDC Back in Black Back tonight? in Black. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Pretty black <laughs> out there. Well, now that's going to be in my head uh, for the rest of the night, but we are <laughs> definitely back in black uh, through the night. We've lost the sun, uh, losing about three minutes every day. I, for one, and I know I uh, might be an outlier and excited for a uh, fall back, which happens this Sunday. Uh, a couple of interesting weather events to get through before our clear but cool weekend. Let me take you to the current temperatures out there right now. Uh, 12 at YVR. We're actually in some milder air uh, today and yesterday we were about seasonal. Taking a quick look across the country, uh, six up towards uh, Kelowna. Uh, temperatures are about seasonal in through most of eastern Canada, but uh, quick chilly Geraldton and Thunder Bay 
uh, already into the minus double digits tonight. Want to track out this big weather maker. This is the one that uh, just formed a low earlier today, and that low is pushing inland. It's going to bring snow up to Terrace and Stewart, and you can see uh, through the uh, uh, Chilcotin area getting a good 10 to 15 centimeters as well. Uh, will we just be seeing rain with this event as that cold front comes through overnight tonight, uh, bringing in a good round of rain between midnight and 4 a.m.? Although I think we'll start to see that rain ramp up uh, around 10 p.m. here. High pressure, though, building quite quickly in behind it for most of the province. You can see that exception is another shot of moisture uh, for the central coastal sections northward. Terrace looking to get another round of snow as we head into the weekend. But for most of us, this is a, a very clear and cool weekend ahead. A quick look at the rainfall forecast in through the north. You can see some bullseyes by Sunday night. Uh, again, same areas dealing with the flooding right now. You only get a really a bit of a break Friday afternoon into Saturday. So something we'll keep an, eyes on, an eye on. Temperatures actually quite mild in the north and getting milder as we head into the weekend. The all important weekend, of course. Uh, temperatures will be quite uh, warm in the south as well for one day, uh, but cooling down as we head into Saturday. So let's take a look at that Halloween forecast. I cannot believe I am only adding the Halloween pumpkin in now. Uh, missed opportunity for me all week, but look at that. Uh, clear and cool for Saturday and Sunday, no matter how you uh, figure out how to celebrate Halloween, Mike. Excellent. Never too late. Glad to see the pumpkin, though. Thanks, Joe. Talk to you again in a bit. <laughs> okay, good. To the U.S. now, where there has been a 33% jump in GDP reported today, the biggest spike in history, though it does follow the biggest ever drop. As Paul Hunter tells us, it still gave Donald Trump something to hold high as he and both Joe Biden made their case to voters in a very important state. If anyone needed reminding that Florida, as ever, will be a key state come election night Tuesday, consider today's dueling late campaign rallies. Joe Biden in southeast Florida. Five days left, folks. While across the state in Tampa, the president. Five days from now, we are going to win Florida. Each battling in the biggest battleground state of all, with its history of extremely close calls, and a track record of picking presidential winners, Florida is especially key right now for Donald Trump, trailing nationally and as well, though just barely, in Florida. If Trump loses that state, he may well lose the White House. If Biden loses Florida, polls suggest he could still take the presidency, but winning Florida would sure make that a lot easier. Today, on what for so many is the single biggest issue, covid a contrast in styles. Biden before a physically distanced crowd, mostly in parked cars. Trump at one of those shoulder to shoulder rallies, many maskless. His pledge today, he'll keep America open. We're never gonna lock down again. We locked down, we understood the disease, and now we're open for business, and that's what it is. As COVID cases now spike in this country, countless are frustrated with a pandemic that threatens lives, but also the economy. Biden countered. I've said it before. I'm not going to shut down the economy. I'm not going to shut down the country, but I'm going to shut down the virus. And he slammed Trump for staging rallies Biden called super spreaders. He's spreading more virus around the country and here in Florida today. The two will focus almost entirely on battleground states from here on in, knowing the end is near for one of them. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. He is striking gold both online and off. Meet this soup gold platter or even panner next. wrenching um, feeling like the floor is falling out from underneath you. Researchers who studied the North Atlantic right whale say these latest numbers are devastating. Just 356 of these whales are left in the world, down from 409 last year. 
While the number of right whale deaths has been down in the last two years, scientists are catching up the data from 2017. There has been just one death recorded in 2020, a calf killed in U.S. waters. And while there have been no deaths or entanglements reported in Canadian oceans so far this year, time is running out. But we have to do it now. We cannot say, okay, well, let's talk about this a little bit more. Let's, you know, do a few more studies. We know they're dying. We know they're getting entangled. We just have to, you know, up the, the protection measures. The federal government has taken proactive measures such as fisheries closures and speed limits on vessels to try and stop the deaths. But Hamilton says at this rate, it will only take 10 to 20 years for all of the breeding females to die off. And there's only about 70 of them left. The latest population estimates do not include the seven calves born in 2019 and the 10 born this year. Two of those calves have already been killed. That may artificially depress the numbers here, you know, by half a dozen to a dozen animals. Um, but, you know, when you're talking from 409 to, let's say, even 375 animals, that's still a huge drop. Kraus says many of the whales are also not getting enough food, which can lead to problems calving. Right now, the right whales are on the hunt for new feeding grounds. And it may take a decade or so before all the right whales figure out what the new oceanic regime is, where the food is, but eventually they'll figure it out. Now, what we have to do, our responsibility, is to keep from killing them during that time. But Krauss says while the latest population round for the right whales, and part of what's giving him that hope is seeing so many different groups come together to try and save the species from extinction. Emma Davey, CBC News. Halifax. Well, there's been quite the find at a spot on the island for one online sensation who uncovered gold nuggets basically in his backyard. Just to know that something as vibrant, bright, shiny yellow like that is just sitting amongst this dirt where I grew up swimming and stuff, it's just, it's unbelievable. Yeah, Paul LaRouche is better known as Pioneer Pauly to his more than 200,000 followers on YouTube. <laughs> Might feel like the gold rush era, but LaRouche says it all began about three years ago when a cousin took him to look for gold in the Souk River. That's when he spotted his first piece of treasure. I came back the very next day consistently for 11 days straight to the same spot that he showed me, and I just kept doing it. Pioneer Polly has turned his hobby into a full-time job. Hunting for treasures and making videos about his adventures for his YouTube subscribers. If you can't get any money out of the gold, you can get maybe <laughs> monetize it with his YouTube subscribers. I was just going to say, yeah, that's probably where the real money is. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, so <laughs> we know Halloween is just a couple days away. Yes, it is. And for one young man in New Brunswick, it's going to be a blast. 11-year-old Eric Prouse is taking the calls for social distancing to an extreme. Yeah, no kidding. Delivering his treats with his homemade candy cannon. Hi, I'm Eric Press. And what are we looking at right here? We're looking at a candy cannon, homemade. Uh, and we have, it is made out of about six pieces. One 
piece to hold, two, sorry, two of the same pieces to hold them up, and one right here. Uh, then we have two tubes taped together right about the middle, and so this is where the candy will come out. And then we have this hose uh, that is compress that is attached to a compressor. Go get the candy. Yeah. And now we load. Take the tube that attaches to the compressor and three, two, one. <laughs> That's pretty good. Good idea. That is very good. I uh, there should be a competition for this. I think most creative way to uh, distance candy give out. Oh, yeah. So there's, we'll work on the title. There's a lot out there, and he's from New Brunswick, so he probably has a po a potato gun as well. Being a good maritimer. That's a great reference. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Joe, and thank you for watching tonight. Dan is here at eleven, right after the national. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good night.